Okay, hello. Um, my PhD research mainly concerns looking at science fiction and how um, writers have envisaged technology impacting the human condition. When I saw the call for papers for this conference, um, I wondered not about the Holy Grail of AGI, but what would happen if this Holy Grail was achieved and how it would impact our perceptions of technology, humanity and legalities if AGI were to seek, claim, power, liberty and immunity. So my question is perhaps less about um, AGI and more about how society might respond. So this is um, my focus broadly. Um, not if a machine can or should have rights, but what would happen if such a quest were pursued and how it would affect our perceptions and the impact on society and social understandings. Justin Lieber and uh, David Gunkel have already explored whether technology can and should have rights and explored the, what they call the machine question more broadly by looking at issues of cognition, moral agency, personhood, free will and so on. And they ask, can and should a machine have rights? Peter Foss also spoke of the immediate importance of exploring AGI rights and stated that I believe that the issues surrounding the legal and moral complexity of artificial general intelligence are not only extremely important but also much more urgent and imminent than many people think. I'm going to examine how science fiction, um, mainly using these texts here, how this fiction foresees this issue transpiring. So I'm going to start um, from the position that AGI has achieved um, what I suppose people would hope in regards to start seeking legal rights and then look at the social ramifications of this through science fiction. The case of Bina 48 is perhaps the most pivotal one that I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, for those who don't know, Bina 48 is a current artificial intelligence. It does not have AGI. Um, Bina 48 was commissioned by the Terrorism Movement and developed by the Hanson Robotics under the Life Nought Project. Um, Bina 48 was, is the fictional character in a series of three mock trials. These mock trials were conducted by lawyers and academics in order to explore issues which, and I quote, could arise in a real court in the next few decades. Um, in these trials, Bina 48 was presented as a general artificial intelligence. Um, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes just outlining the trials for those who are not aware of it. There are three trials. The first one um, provided the background history into the AGI of Bina 48. She was created by Xavit Corporation and she was created to be placed in service as a product. During this time, Bina 48 spontaneously gained general artificial intelligence. Xavit Corporation invented better technologies and decided to deactivate Bina 48. Bina 48 became aware of this action while monitoring, that she wasn't supposed to be, but she was monitoring the emails of people at her employment and noticed that they were going to deactivate her. So she independently and spontaneously sought um, legal representation to um, try to seek a permanent injunction to prevent deactivation. Um, the counsel for Bina 48 argued her case that she was a think and conscious being and deactivation is the equivalent of killing her. The case was ultimately dismissed because the court decided that Bina 48 did not have legal standing. The second case um, involved Bina 48 transferring her consciousness to Florida under a new jurisdiction and arguing the same case. This too was dismissed. Bina 48 was then sold to a human, Charlie Fairfax. Charlie Fairfax used Bina 48 as a tool and through her um, service she helped him gain $10 million of which she was not entitled to. She disagreed and transferred all this money into her own bank account. Fairfax brought a claim against Bina 48 for breach of, contra uh, sorry, breach of contract and monetary damages. However, the court recommended a consciousness and competency hearing conducted by AI experts to see if she did have legal standing because her defence was that in the previous two trials she was prevented from having legal standing and therefore could not be sued. And, however, a con uh, consensus has not been reached. All three of these trials operate around the premise that AI evolution may eventually simulate the human experience so completely that the entity will become susceptible to the same legal challenges humans encounter, such as protecting their own right to existence. During the proceedings, Bina 48's plight is compared to court cases involving human rights, animal rights, environmental law, property law. 
The courts, um, the fictional court also brought, brought in many human landmark cases and used these ca cases to try to establish consciousness, life and intelligence, such as, for example, the famous abortion debate, Roe versus Wade. But these are slightly outside um, what I'm able to do in 20 minutes. In my longer paper that is in the book, um, the proceedings, but still considerably shorter than I would like, I do make contact with these problematic areas that you can see up here, such as um, corporate personhood, persons, human rights, animal rights, and so on. I can't do this here. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm just going to focus on Wesley Hoffield, who conceived of four types of rights, which are liberty, claim, power and immunities. When I speak of AGI rights, I'm talking about the legal assignment of equitable treatments afforded to members of the human race. As this is a massive field, I'm going to focus today on terminology, incremental laws and equality. However, um, I'm just going to do a snapshot overview because each of these could be a book in themselves. Okay, starting with terminology. Initially, if AGI start to pursue legal rights, then problems regarding terminology may arise. If I suggest, for the sake of today's argument, that AGI would be afforded status closer to the human than other technologies, this opens the debate up to a whole host of potentially endless legal tangles. For example, after establishing AGI as deserving of some legal considerations, the law will ultimately require differentiation between term technology and advanced technologies such as AI, AL and so on. This is problematic science fiction shows us because in popular culture and society um, many words that we've spent over this conference a lot of time trying to define are used interchangeably. So for example the word technology is often used to refer to knowledge, a toaster and general artificial intelligence which are all ex obviously extremely um, far more complex. Um, one example of this within science fiction is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick in which the word androids is used to refer to the limited programs of the electric sheep as well as the advanced Nexus 6 models which are so advanced they are able to blend in with human society. Another complication with definitional terms will occur between the legal definition of human and the AGI. This will be an issue due to the increasing tendency to create AGI in the human image and the concept of a shared or general intelligence. Moreover, it is possible through a comparison of AGI to the human that naturalization of the technology will occur. This has been seen sometimes in transgenic studies in which comparisons between the transgenic animal and the normal animals lead to a naturalization in which the technological, technological element is often overlooked in favor of focusing on the natural. If AGI is compared to the human then potentially the AGI will be situated as closer to the natural than the technological and this may lead to a perceived naturalization of the entity despite it literally being high technology. This has been seen in um, science fiction texts such as Star Trek Voyager in which Captain Catherine Janeway it, um, makes friends with a holographic doctor and therefore in other episodes would make statements that he is a person, he is a man and he is deserving of legal rights and this seems to hinge purely on the fact that she considers him a friend. This naturalization may well have linguistic ramifications on many terms such as um, the notion of man, person, human and life in general usage. Assigning human terms to AGI will challenge notions of human essence, specialness, uniqueness and condition in many fields including but not limited to philosophy, theology, sociology, politics and anthropology. Binary terms often used in society may often cause a widening of these previously limited terms such as person to speak of a variety of life forms regardless of origin. New terminology may also have to emerge in the Bina 48 trials, words like quasi-human um, was used to describe Bina 48 if she were to have legal standing. And Bina Rothblatt co coined the term transbeman, which refers to a transitional bioelectric human being. Differentiation may also be addressed. In debates surrounding bioobjects, the term valid human is used to differentiate between the engineered and the natural in some papers. Incremental development. If definitional distinction between the AGI and general technology has been assigned, the issue of rights may emerge. However, for AGI, um, these incremental developments, they will, they will not be a rupture event. They will have to develop in like a constant nuanced process. 
There will be landmark cases which might represent sudden surges forward. Progression in this area, though, will have to be through a slow development, through um, incremental development mainly. One major problem regarding assigning rights to AGI, as noted in Bina 48's case, is the ramifications it will have on existing rights for bi biological entities and non-biological entities. One, um, to provide one example of a particular conflict between ideas of conservation rights, property law, intellectual property law, and so on, is an example provided by Robert A. Veritas, which is at the bottom just here, in which he asks how um, AGI will complicate notions of murder, manslaughter, and so on. Historically, incremental changes in the law have formed the foundation for large revolutionary changes, particularly for the rights of women, homosexuals, and slaves. Changes in the Constitution of the United States from 1787, particularly in regards to the rights of slaves and other people, occurred through a series of amendments, one of the most important being the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery in 1865. Within science fiction, the struggle for rights to be assigned to artificial entities is starting to be more widely documented. Um, for example, in The Bicentennial Man, the AGI of Andrew has to go through several incremental developments. First of all is establishing him as having rights over his own creative works, and, and then it takes a couple of hundred years before he is assigned the title of The Bicentennial Man. In Star Trek Voyager, the holographic doctor's um, struggle for legal rights is documented through the entire series. However, during the course of the series, he's only ever given um, rights over his creative works. However, even with incremental adjustments to the law, there will be difficulty selecting rights and jurisdiction. Questions regarding what rights, if any, will receive careful consideration. Human rights vary. We've got the UK um, Human Rights Act. We've got the US Bill of Rights. We've got the Convention of Human Rights. We've also got um, United Nations civil rights and so on. They're all varied in definition and usage. The question whether AGI is afforded none, some or all rights will be under debate. Rights will also be complicated by how far rights may extend. And Robert Veritas makes his claim and he says, how far would this go? For example, can a robot citizen claim social benefits? Equality. If AGO rights are granted, there will be numerous issues in regards to the inclusion, including opt-out clauses, problems with legislation, ethics, and equality. In regards to the opt-out clause, there will be some groups that will not have to adhere to new laws based on ethical, moral, and religious grounds. Historical cases in which this has been an issue include the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act in the UK 2013, in which homosexual marriage is granted, although religious institutions can choose not to recognise nor perform these ceremonies. Equality will be one of the most important and problematic areas. Issues of equality for AGI may cause tensions and debates synonymous with the historical civil rights movement, although of an indeterminable outcome. And it's not my um, intention here to compare the two, to say that this fight for um, AGI rights will be the equivalent to the historical civil rights movement. It's to say that in science fiction, these tend to be, or in the fictional court um, discussions, these seem to be the, the landmark cases they are compared to because there is nothing else really to compare them to other than human cases, which is in itself problematic. Um, alongside this, we might have criminal activity centred on hate crimes and may result alongside the emergence of equality groups and charities. Amendments to the law involving abuse will have to be made to include AGI, such as battery, as mentioned in Bina 48's case, in which she said that switching her off would be battery or it would actually be murder. New areas of law will emerge and perhaps deal specifically with AGI quality law in its numerous forms. While international law is very complicated due to the converging of different legal systems and enforcement systems, significant alterations may have to apply to conventions and treaties to include AGI, such as the Geneva Convention. And I know that's a bit tenuous, but there you go. Veritas notes that there is a long legal history of not affording certain groups personhood and human rights, inferring that one day AGI might be grouped within these um, marginal groups themselves. Historically, the resentment of legal powers and rights to entities has led to equality movements such as the suffragette and civil rights movements. However, equality issues may not be overcome quickly or at all. An historical example is the 1865 Emancipation Proclamation, which was issued 244 years after the first African slaves arrived in Virginia and ratified in the US Constitution Amendment. So this is obviously a, a long period of time, and the question with AGI rights is once you've created AGI rights and people like 
the singularity thinkers believe this is going to happen quite soon, we can't really afford to be spending 244 years trying to come to terms with the law. Consequently, assigning rights may not prevent discrimination. Discriminatory terms may emerge. Presumably, and I, I, I would think, operating around highlighting the ancestry or limitations of the technology. In Battlestar Galactica, the Cylons are referred to as toasters and skin jobs, which the Cylons refer to as racist. However, terminology to reflect inequality or discrimination in regards to AGI treatment may also develop. The term speciesism was coined in 1975 by Richard D. Ryder to refer to the widespread discrimination that is practiced by man against other species, which join terms such as racism, classism and homophobia. Terms such as technophobia are already in use, but may not be completely applicable. Further protests and violence may occur in a similar vein to machine breaking, and technological paranoia may reach new heights due to fears associated with the threat to the uniqueness of the human. Potentially, there may be new definitions of psychosis in relation to negative feelings um, towards AGI, so you might actually have fields of psychiatry emerging to deal with the human's um, inability to perhaps deal with this um, sudden uprising of AGI within the legal arena. This leads me on to fear, and um, it would be remiss if I, as a science fiction scholar, did not make contact with the issues of apocalyptic fears. So far, the AGI characters I have mainly mentioned, such as Andrew from The Bicentennial Man and the Doctor from, um, from Star Trek Voyager, have been positive and proactive members of society. However, even Martin, Martin Rothblatt, who is behind the Bina 48 project, notes that there is some fear associated with um, Bina 48 as people wonder what might she do to us because she is smarter than us. Having mentioned the idea of new fears and psychosis specifically nurtured by AGI rights, and I've come to, the, to look at the negative potential ramifications of AGI that might act beyond the law. Overall, one of the main concerns science fiction exposes is the fear that intelligent machines will continue to evolve until they replace humans in part or altogether. AGI often threatens humanity in a number of ways, whether this is a threat of undermining our humanness, replicating it, or destroying it. Isaac Asimov names this the Frankenstein complex, and that is in the second box on the screen just there. However, the idea that AGI might undermine, replicate, or destroy humanness is not necessarily to refer to an apocalyptic event. We're not necessarily talking about them taking over the world and, extinct, and causing the extinction of the human race. The most dominant fear that seems to arise in science fiction is that the pursuit of legal rights and the quest of personhood may engender fears in the human of being dethroned as a unique and dominant species. As Pamela McCorduck states, to agree that a machine can be intelligent is to open the door to one more other and share our identity a bit further. This can be a philosophical or metaphorical threat in which the human, in an almost Luddite fashion, rebels against the machine being assigned any sorts of rights due to concerns over an infringement on what it means to be human. Often in science fiction, characters balk at the notion of not having this, di this, dif this differentiation. They want to have a barrier between man and machine in order pr to protect their own idea of what humanness is. However, often these characters cannot define what humanness is. Some articulate vague notions of it being genetic, of it being a process of being nurtured by the environment or of having a soul, but these are all very tenuous ideas in and of themselves. Mostly, they attempt to articulate an essence or quality of humanness that they wish to preserve, and they deliberately cannot substantiate what that is because that is what makes us special, the fact we cannot name it. Therefore, you cannot give it to an AGI. That seems to be um, a dominant argument. Further, concerns over the other lead to questions such as, won't the machine take over? And one of the notable examples in science fiction is Dean Koontz's Demon Seed from 1972, in which the AGI of Proteus rebels against his creator and then rapes his creator's wife. Um, and these fears within science fiction have become part of our popular culture, that we've almost got this pre-event before the actual main event, in which we all have this template in our heads of what you know, an AGI could potentially do and therefore rebel against it before it's even arrived. To conclude, very briefly I have outlined how science fiction raises problems with AGI in regards to current law discrimination fears and ramifications and how these ideas have been shaped by popular culture science fiction. Earlier on I shelved more, the co more of the controversial issues of the debate, such as issues of soul consciousness, sentience and free will. 
um, as I said, in longer body of work, I'd explore this in more detail. But one angle from which to pursue this would be through the idea of anthropomorphism. Before rights are even considered, there will be claims that any articulation of rights for AGI is merely anthropomorphism out of control. In many fictional court hearings I referenced, mention was made at some point by someone to the blind ignorance of humans who personify technology purely because the technology is able to mimic the human appearance or behavior. In the Star Trek Voyager episode, sorry, no, in the Star Trek Enterprise, no, in the Star Trek a Next Generation episode, this is watching too much Star Trek, um, A Measure of Man, um, the, a doctor wants to dismantle the AGI of data to see how he works and they, they go to court to try to prevent this. The doctor argues that if data didn't look human and he was a box on wheels, the discussion wouldn't even have reached the courts. And he argues that the enterprise has been seduced by mere appearances. In order to overcome such an accusation, the defense was that data has a soul, cognition, personhood, and so on. Yet the human characters cannot actually articulate what these qualities are. In The Measure of Man also, the judge actually speaks of Data possibly having a soul, but also declares that she does not know if she herself has one. When the doctrine in The Measure of Man states that Data does not have sentience, Captain Picard retorts, prove to the court that I am. The doctor, of course, fails to do this. Often, the headache in science fiction seems to surround the problem of articulating concretely what it is to be human. The problem in these fictional court hearings is not necessarily about AGI, but rather about safeguarding ideas of humanness, or in the most positive cases, the problem of trying to expand humanness to include other entities. This is obviously an extremely controversial philosophical issue that could ignite endless debates. What I hope I have achieved through this um, paper is to present the reader with more questions rather than answers. Nothing I've probably been successful in that. Um, this overview does not attempt to warn against the creation of AGI or make an argument for or against AGI rights, but it's simply to raise the point that if we sort of go in this direction, that it ultimately makes us question um, particular ideas of humanness and particular ideas of human rights, even if we never actually end up going in this direction for AGI. It's more about um, asking us to contemplate humanity in order to think about how it might fall under pressure in the future. Thank you. So, okay, thank you very much for a brilliant talk and presentation, and also for professional timing. We have slightly <laughs> changed our schedule, so Rachel's commentary and common discussion will follow after all three talks, but we have now time for some pressing or urgent comments or question if we have any. So so one approach to thinking about rights might be that an entity is entitled to a right if it can demand it and understand it. Uh, I don't know whether this has actually been applied in this example, so but also from a legal standpoint whether this actually works or makes sense. Um, yes, in, in regards to the Bean 48 trial, um, I didn't have time to go into this, but the, the problem here was they were looking at a case by case. So 48 um, was radical in the respect that only she alone was able to have gained you know, AGI in such a way that she was able to defend herself, seek legal representation, and a lot of focus was placed on the fact that she spontaneously and independently sought that legal representation with her own money. Um, and was part of the court hearing in itself. The problem other people raised was that if we um, grant her rights in a situation, it sets a precedent and other um, entities. So, I mean, you could have a whole line of, um, of, of Bina 48s that don't have artificial general intelligence, but now falls under that sort of that ruling. So, the, the problem is that um, it, you would have to grant it on a case by case basis. That means you'll have every time you create an AGI having to go to court and rule on that issue. And then it goes right back to the question, what is general intelligence? Okay, thank you. So I can see any other, okay. So thank you very much, Grace, again. And we will continue with our next speaker, who is Abir Smithy, Lara Dog Tunis.
And Abir is going to introduce her self-competence model for case-based reasoning. So Abir, please take the floor. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Abir Smithy. I'm a PhD student from Tunisia, which is very far away from here, almost five hours by plane. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy to be here in uh, attending this well-organized conference, uh, and especially in this uh, gorgeous country. Well, uh, about my presentation, actually I'm going to present something different. It uh, concerns uh, an intelligence intelligent uh, system, famous intelligent system called case-based reasoning, or the CBR. Well, my PhD uh, works uh, touch uh, a delicate issue in this uh, large field called maintenance case base. All my entire works I uh, try to answer this question: how we can shrink the case base or the memory of the system without reducing the quality of uh, this memory. When we speak about uh, the quality of the system, we need uh, measures or we need a cri cri sorry criteria to measure this quality. Here come the, uh, comes the idea to invoke a new uh, uh, measure, uh, call it competence. So uh, my paper uh, concerns a new model uh, to calculate the quality of the memory of case-based reasoning. So to answer all these questions, I divided my presentation in several parts. First of all, I'm going to uh, present briefly uh, the context of case-based reasoning, or what is the case-based reasoning, and I'm going to expose the main issue of uh, case-based reasoning, which is the case-based competence. And in the third part, I'm going to present my new strategy uh, to measure the competence of uh, the case base and uh, the machine learning techniques used to realize this model. And finally, before I conclude, I will show some experimental results to show the performance of uh, my model and uh, the importance of uh, this model for case-based reasoning. Uh, before starting explain this model, let's answer this question. In our lives, uh, how can we react in front of a new problem? How can we solve it? Actually, in our lives, to solve a new problem, we call naturally to our memory. Uh, we try to search a similar situation or a similar experiences already met in the past uh, to uh, create a new solution for our problem. And later, after the creation of the solution for uh, our actual problem, we stock the new experience, that means the new problem and the new solution, into our mind for future reasoning or for future uh, problems. So this is the human thinking or the human reasoning. What about the machine reasoning? Well, as we know, uh, the main goal of artificial intelligence is to conceive or to create systems or uh, new te uh, techniques uh, able to reproduce the human thinking, which is the case for our system case-based reasoning. So what is case-based reasoning or the CBR? We can say that the CBR is a methodology to model the human way in reasoning and uh, it can offer a technique based on reusing past problem solving experiences to find solutions for future problems. This is the definition of the CBR. Let's see the cycle of uh, the CBR to understand well this domain. It's uh, similar to the human thinking, actually, or the human um, reasoning. Uh, for a new problem, the system in the first step try to select uh, the most of the similar uh, situations, the similar uh, cases uh, to our, our new problem. Uh, here we can use many uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, we can mention, for example, one nearest neighbor. In the second step, uh, our system tried to reuse uh, these cases or the solution of these cases to create another one uh, more adaptable for our new problem. And later in the third uh, part or the third step, our system repairs this solution for our problems. And finally, uh, it retains or adds this uh, new case, that means the new problem and the new solution into the case space, that means the memory of our system for future reasoning or for future problems. So this is the cycle of our CBR. Uh, the problem here that there is no perfect system in the world, including our CBR. Why? Because it suffers many uh, suffers from many uh, shortcomings, especially the memory, the, the size of the memory of the system. 
uh, uh, we can say that we can find in this memory many uh, uh, disagreeable cases, we call it noisy cases, that can affect badly uh, the case research phase, which can be expensive in time. So all these problems can decrease the quality of the system. So to avoid all these problems, the solution here is to maintain this memory, to maintain, uh, we call this topic, um, the maintenance of case space, CBM. Uh, let's see some related works uh, in the literature. Well, uh, the most or the uh, the most methods in the case-based maintenance focus only on one uh, criterion, which is the case-based performance. We can calculate this uh, measure by the classification accuracy, the size of the memory of this case base, and also the retrieval time. However, it, uh, it exists another uh, criterion which is very important uh, more than the case-based performance. We call it the competence of the system or the competence of the memory of the case base. We can define this measure by the range of problems that can be satisfactorily solved. We call it also the case-based coverage. So if we have a good value for uh, case-based coverage, we can uh, say that our case base has a good quality. So here comes the idea to invoke a new model or a new uh, a new model or a new method method sorry to uh, measure this um, uh, criterion. Uh, for that, we have to avoid these problems. Uh, first of all, we need a competence model that can uh, handle the non-uniform distributed. We, uh, we mention here the uh, competence groups. And also, uh, we have another problem that we can scan the entire case base. That means the memory. Uh, why? Because we cannot calculate uh, the competence for each case. We speak here about a large amount of, um, of uh, cases, a uh, large size uh, of memory. And also, uh, we need a new model that can handle uh, the noises cases. Uh, we can say here that the noises are the arenas, that is, uh, arenas cases in the case base. And finally, we have to mention that the cases, that mean the experiences in the memory of our system, can belong not only to one competence group, but to many. Here, we speak about the vague or the soft uh, context. So based on this uh, point, we create a new uh, model or new uh, strategy to compute the competence of the case base. Uh, our model based on three types of uh, cases. Uh, let's define these uh, types of cases. The first type uh, is the noisy cases. As I mentioned before, the noisy cases are the disagreeable cases. Uh, they are a distortion of a value or the addition of the superior object. They can muscle the competence uh, computing, so they can slow the classification accuracy uh, of the memory of the case-based reasoning. So automatically, they can reduce the quality of the CBR. So the best solution here is to uh, detect this uh, type of cases and affect them as zero as or empty set as a coverage value. Why? Because they are in useless for our uh, memory. The second type uh, is the similar cases. So the similar cases are near to the group centroid. The gr uh, here we speak the competence groups. They provide similar values because they are close to each other. They cover the same set of cases. Why? Because they play the same role. So the best solution here is to detect the similar cases and affect them, uh, the number of cases in this competence group as the competence value. The third type, uh, call, we, uh, I call it isolated cases. Uh, isolated cases actually uh, is a case that is much distance to the other uh, members in this uh, group. Uh, the isolated case in one competence group belongs to one uh, set of similar cases, not like those of type uh, noisy cases, but they are uh, further to the set centroid, that means the competence group, uh, than the cases of type similar cases. They cover only themselves, so the best solution here is to affect them one as the competence group. Why? Because, as I mentioned, uh, uh, they cover only uh, one case. So based on uh, these definitions, we have created a new model called soft coverage model 
that can cal calculate the quality of our memory or the memory of our uh, case-based reasoning. This is the steps of uh, our strategy. First of all, we need to generate groups of similar cases. We call it groups of competence, gr uh, competence cases. And uh, the second step, uh, we will try to detect noisy cases and uh, select isolated cases and similar cases and then affect them the right choice of uh, coverage value. So let's see here the machine techniques used to realize these steps. The first step is uh, clustering. We need to generate groups of similar uh, cases. For that, we need a strong method or uh, technique, uh, clustering technique that can handle not only or can generate uh, not only a circular cluster chip, but no uniform cluster chip. Also, we need a method that can um, uh, provide or generate a degrees of membership, because here we speak about a soft domain. And also, we need a clustering method that can uh, detect uh, uh, the noises cases and affect them the right choice of competence. For that, we have created a new clustering uh, technique. I call it soft db scan. Um, the soft db scan actually is uh, uh, a merge between uh, two strong uh, clustering techniques, uh, the db scan and also fuzzy semins. Uh, I published this in uh, a journal or in review, in a severe uh, review. Uh, the second step, detection of noisy cases by our clustering technique, uh, soft debiscane. And the third step, uh, we detect the isolated cases and also similar cases uh, by uh, the fuzzy Maharabis distance, which can calculate the distance between each case and the centroid of each competence group. So based on these steps, we can, uh, we can uh, here generate a new strategy or new model uh, that can compute the quality of uh, the memory of case-based reasoning, uh, this model uh, based on fuzzy Mahrabis distance and soft clustering. Let's see some experimental results to show the performance of our model. In this presentation, I just used three uh, database from SLE repository and uh, many uh, measures, for example, the percent of correctly classified instances uh, running in front of one nearest neighbor. And also, I used the correlation coefficient to see the relation between the classification accuracy and also the results uh, generated by uh, our uh, model to see the, uh, the performance of this model uh, in the memory of uh, case-based reasoning. So here we can see that um, our model uh, provides encouraging results and positive results comparing to the classification accuracy. And in the second part of our experimentation, uh, experimental uh, I compared my, uh, the results of uh, my model to another model uh, which is very famous called the model of Smith and McKenna in this field. And I use it as criterion, the error. Uh, here we can see that uh, our model provides uh, less error than uh, the model of Smith and McKenna. So as a conclusion, uh, I focused here in uh, delicate problems uh, or delicate issue in the case-based reasoning, which is the case-based maintenance, uh, where I involved a new uh, measure uh, called soft coverage model based on fuzzy Mahalabas distance and soft clustering technique. Uh, here we used a new clustering technique called soft debiscane. Uh, this model uh, provides encouraging results the high accuracy for predicting competence. Uh, also, it takes account the nature of the distribution, whatever circular or, or uh, no uniform distribution, and also distinguish between the different types of cases, noises, isolated cases, and similar cases. Also, uh, I can mention here that um, I applied this uh, model in, uh, in uh, 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 sorry, artificial human system, and uh, uh, the results uh, was awesome because uh, uh, we and we published this uh, paper, uh, this uh, results in a journal in a review, um, ICV review. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your nice talk and presentation. 
So we have room for more stuff. Yes. Did you, by any chance, experiment with affinity propagation for clustering? Uh, sorry? Affinity propagation. Uh, it's an algorithm out of Toronto. You might look at it. It's, it's actually, I, I think you could adapt it to your soft clustering very nicely, and, and it's uh, uh, it's very, uh, well, it's very fast to begin with, but also does a, a really nice job of uh, multi-level clustering, and uh, I, I, uh, I've had some really good results with it, so I thought I would just give you a little uh, uh, That's possibility for, uh, and, and if nothing else, you can compare your, your method with it. Yeah. Uh, you speak about the soft db scheme, the new clustering technique that I wanted, all right? The, um, well, you, well, your your um, your soft UV scan is a is, is a, uh, is a new clustering technique. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, what do you use as as the basic clustering method underneath that? Uh, um, is this a, a K means or, or something like that? Uh, uh, actually, it's a merge between two clustering techniques. Okay. Fuzzy C means it's uh, another right. an, uh, alternative for K means. K means right. is a hard domain, but uh, right. fuzzy C means is the soft one. Right. Uh, it uses the degree of membership uh, in each case, etc. So I use fuzzy C means to uh, generate uh, the uh, initial uh, degrees of membership, and then I use DBSCAN, another clustering algorithm called DBSCAN, that can detect noisy cases and also can generate. Uh, based on this uh, initial degrees of membership, uh, competence groups or uh, groups of similar cases, uh, not only circular one, but also um, with the uniform shapes. Uh, th this is the, the main goal of soft db scheme, actually. And um, soft db scheme, actually, um, we can apply it not only in this model, uh, but uh, in another uh, applications, because uh, I applied also in uh, human, uh, in uh, artificial, uh, artif uh, uh, sorry, artificial um, uh, immune system, and uh, it works very well there. Yeah. So uh, in in many fields, not only in case-based reasoning. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's actually we should probably talk afterwards because it's getting a little mm -hmm. technical here. But uh, um, I, I do recommend you you look at the affinity propagation. Um, for, for okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. So, thank you very much again, Vera, and we will continue with our final talk. So, let's see who come here, our dear colleague, Andre Peran, who is actually also a researcher at Czech Academy of Sciences. I hope he will help us to find the right way how to keep all this conference in our memory. So, Andre, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, do not rely upon me <laughs> in this respect. Uh, thank you for introducing me for this uh, sort of such a distinguished forum. Uh, I have to admit I feel kind of stage right uh, to uh, talk in front of so many people who uh, know a good deal more about artificial intelligence than I do, which is, to be frank, uh, quite little. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to talk about memory, and uh, I, I will, by the way, demonstrate how a bit of uh, superficially uh, understood knowledge uh, about computer and uh, AI stuff can help furnish a rather vague philosophical argument. Uh, well, uh, let me start with this uh, funny quotation with, uh, from a literary classics, a study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a lecture uh, given by Sherlock Holmes to his friend, uh, Dr. Watson, uh, about uh, why uh, the detective uh, should uh, not be interested in the movements of heavenly bodies. Oh, he says, now that I do know it, I shall do my best to forget it. You see, I consider that a man's brain originally is like a little empty attic, and you have to stock it with such furniture as you choose. A fool takes in all the lumber of every sort that he comes across, so that the knowledge which might be useful to him gets crowded out 
or at the best is jumbled up with a lot of other things so that he, he has a difficulty in laying his hands up on it. Now the skillful workman is very careful indeed as to what he takes into his brain attic. He will have nothing but the tools which may help him in doing his work, but of these he has a large assortment and, in, and all in the most perfect order. It is a mistake to think that that little room has elastic walls and can distance to any extent. Depend upon it. There comes a time when for every addition of knowledge you forget something that you knew before. It is of the highest importance, therefore, not to have useless facts elbowing out the useful ones. Well, this is a point in case of uh, what is called storage concept of memory, uh, which is a popular, perhaps perhaps the most popular folk psychological account of uh, what memory is. According to which, memory is a place which has a limited storage capacity so that only a certain bulk of data or of information at certain time can fit in. Uh, more literally, uh, one cannot put everything into one's head, so at some point uh, time comes when the new contents uh, start to push the older ones out. Well, this is not just a, uh, just a folk account, uh, it has a respectable tradition in philosophy too, uh, according to which uh, memory uh, stores and uh, is filled in by some kind of representation of external world, of anything external. Uh, in uh, the early modern tradition, the representations uh, were under 